Welcome to 2013's first video, and regular viewers will realise I didn't get any new shirts for Christmas. This week's topic is something that's all over the press, inter-dealer brokers. They're linked to the LIBOR scandal currently unfolding. We had yet another bank fined just before Christmas for its involvement in rigging the LIBOR rate. Well, this video isn't specifically about the scandal, but it's about the key role played in the markets by inter-dealer brokers. And that is a role not to be confused with any other role in the markets. So it's a bit of a mouthful. Interdealer broker can be hyphenated, but there it is, interdealer broker. Not to be confused with your stockbroker, the person you go to advice for, um, or any other role in the financial market. So this video is going to introduce what they do, or why they're in the news, okay, and to what extent you should worry about them. At the end of the video, I'll also give the answers to my two final video of 2012 quiz questions. Okay, so interdealer brokers, what do they do? Very, very specialist role, and you wouldn't really come across it as a retail investor unless you've been reading the newspapers recently. And then suddenly you'll find that names that maybe you hadn't heard before, the likes of Tullet Prebon, for example, the likes of um, Cantor Fitzgerald, uh, and so on, are plastered all over the newspapers. ICAP, another big name, okay, alongside banks like UBS. Why? This is a very specialist role. What they do, in effect, is act as the middlemen between the middlemen. They are the market makers middleman, all right? And this is one of the most cutthroat places in financial markets, okay? If you're ever thinking about applying for a job there, if any young graduates are watching this, um, don't go in if you're not fairly hard-hearted. This is where some of the most aggressive trades that take place in financial markets are done. So what are they, what's going on? What are they up to? Well, imagine um, I put down a market maker at a big investment bank. Now, in another video, I cover what market makers are, right? A trader, a dealer, for want of a better expression. And here's their problem. They want to offload a load of, well, it could be anything, a load of currency, a load of equities, a load of bonds, okay? And the key here, is they don't want to ring round all their competitors, because, I mean, you've got to sell to somebody, because they're looking for a buyer. Okay? They don't just ring round all their competitors and go, I really need to dump a whole load of stuff right now. What's your price? Because in a market, if you do that, you'll get absolutely killed, all right? Because everyone's going to think, oh, poor old Tim, he's stuck with a load of stuff he doesn't want. He's got to offload it quickly, okay? So they're going to bring the price down, so you'll get fleeced. So, ideally, what you want to do is you do want to offload whatever it is you're trying to get rid of, probably to other banks, uh, other market makers, that's traders, for want of a better expression, at other banks, okay? But you don't want to do it as a direct trade, all right? So, enter the inter-dealer broker. Completely separate organisation, the IDB, what they're going to do is contact other market makers on your behalf, okay, and set up a deal without revealing who you are. That's the crucial point, okay? They're not going to make a phone call saying, oh, Tim needs to offload a load of, oh, did I say Tim? My mistake, right? Anonymously, they're going to act as a middleman contacting other banks, gauging their interest in a particular trade and trying to build a book. So what these other banks may not realize is that their buy orders, if you like, are being aggregated together anonymously, so we've got a matched trade. All right, it doesn't have to be three on this side, it could be one market maker, it could be 12, it doesn't really matter, but the principle is that the IDB is acting anonymously to match buyers and sellers, okay? In practice, the way that works is, you know, in the private over-the-counter market, as it's called, okay, um, the, this tends to be sort of private markets, slightly illiquid transactions, maybe difficult deals to do, something funny about them. That's where IDBs really feature. Um, what you tend to find is you just look up on a screen, okay, and it'll give you a range of different prices, but you won't know who is the other side of the trade. That's what the IDBs do. They kind of, if you want to see it that way, organise the screen you look at, all right? But they're acting as, as anonymous intermediaries. Now, because of that, they've got to make a living. Right, they've got some money somehow, they're not supposed to actually trade their own book, as it's called. Right, they're meant to be sitting there performing a function, 
But the way they make money is they take a cut. Okay? And uh, if you look at some of the email transcripts uh, of one or two of the recent sort of libel scandal trades, you'll get dealers going, you know, try, trying to set up trying to set up trades to do with the, the interest rate based trades, if you like, um, based around the sort of whole LIBOR fixing scandal, saying things like, you know, well, mate, if you can do me a 50,000 buck deal, I can make it worth your while. You know, and some of those conversations are between market makers and instead of brokers, potentially, all right, because Basically, obviously, the you know, market maker is trying to encourage an steel broker to go out and do a favourable trade. And, you know, 50,000 buck deal, that's 50 billion US dollars. You've only got to take a very small slice of that, way less than 1%, to be making a very tidy commission. So, steel brokers work on the basis that, you know, big, they want to get big trades going, and then they take what looks like an extremely small slice of the value of each trade that they set up, okay, but it quickly adds up. So some of these firms, Cantor Fitzgeralds, for example, um, ICAPs are extremely profitable, all right, because they're performing a very valuable service in the market. So there it is. Interdealer broker, not a term that most retail brokers, uh, sorry, retail clients will come across day in, day out. It's a specialist role. It is almost like, you know, the, the, the market maker's broker, right? Anonymous intermediary firms setting up uh, what could be otherwise awkward, large, illiquid, specialised deals in the private over-the-counter market on behalf of typically investment banks and other institutions. Now, just wrap up the video by saying a couple of things. Number one, if, if I used a lot of jargon there and you're thinking, oh crikey, market makers, over-the-counter, what, what do these things mean? Do take a look at some of my other videos where I explain what market makers are, what conventional brokers are, for example. And also do take a look at the Money Week Basics series by clicking on the link below if you prefer to read all about that stuff. Okay? And let's finish this video by just answering a couple of questions I posed before I disappeared at Christmas. Number one, who was Norman Lamont's special economic advisor around the time that Sterling was ejected? the exchange rate mechanism, a forerunner of the euro? Answer, David Cameron. Second question was, and for anyone baffled by what I'm talking about now, take a look at my last video uh, just before Christmas, uh, where I basically set this challenge. I said, if you put nine dots down on a napkin as you're eating your Christmas lunch, okay, good way to keep the kids entertained this one, can you join those nine dots, which are meant to be in a square, using four straight lines? Only two other rules are no doubling back and no lifting your pen off the page. So anyone thinking, well, I can do it in three? No, because that means taking your pen off the page. All right, here's the answer, or here's an answer. One of the conditions I didn't give you was that you have to stay within the nine dots. Aha. So, like that is one, like that is two, like that is three, like that is four. Continuous lines, all straight, didn't take my pen off the page. And, okay, for those people wondering where the expression thinking outside the box comes from, well, you saw it first here. To download this free video to your favorite mobile device, find us on iTunes by searching for Money Week. And the entire video archive is also available free, just visit moneyweek.com.